notification from from the speaker saying your fans are waiting, make an episode now, record it. Probably just some fucking big ass shit they tell everybody to get you guys to get the service, actually buy the service and all that, or whatever else. And then it turned out I had a bunch of views. So I was like, wow, this is fucking cool. So I can't stop doing my podcast. So unfortunately, I have to stop playing songs every once in a while. And I mean, I haven't been playing songs all that much anyways lately. Um, one here and there, something that's relevant, whatever the case is. But to be completely honest, I haven't really been playing much, so... It may not be that big of a change, but just keep that in mind. Maybe I don't play songs anymore, that may be it. Kind of pulling back from playing the songs for a while, and I don't even really care about fucking copyright infringements. Um, they normally have on fucking YouTube all the time. That's why I always have the other video as well, so you can still get the content. If you're in one of the countries where it gets blocked, or whatever the case is. I mean, there's a certain amount of people's stuff you're allowed to use. There is. But I don't think it's a whole copyrighted song on the show. So, anyways. That's enough about that. If you don't want to try to do it, it's a big pass. Back of my fucking neck. Went to the gym last night with my wife, so. I spent a little bit more. I spent all day at work, even though I worked in the fucking pool last week. Thanks. So, yeah, let's get into something spiritual, shall we? Yeah, we're supposed to be starting to get into the Kabbalah. Great work, self transformation. How to. What to. Where to. Stay tuned for that shit. Well, off, but, um, look it. I'll just keep going. So, my last video, yeah, I'm still waiting on the whole Spotify thing. Um, not Spotify thing, the whole, um, Spreaker thing to find out what the fuck's going on. I sent them about three messages now to see what's going on. You know, YouTube does a good job of whenever you do copyright infringements, they have like what level it is. And, you know, I get it. Same with Spreaker, you know, whatever my copyright infringement was. Like I said, maybe something changed the policies, but I've been doing the same thing since the get-go. I take clips from people's teachings to help teach. I, um, I use songs, and, um, and I download the MP3s and I put them on there. So, Anyways, sorry, I was reading my wife's text. We're at the gym right now, but they're like past capacity, so I think we only one of us can go in. So I let her go in, but she's not gonna stay very long. I know without me, she likes going to the gym with somebody. She's more comfortable. She's a very social person. I'm kind of not the opposite. I mean, social, but under certain circumstances, I think that's to do with people too, right? To be around a group of people, and you know, when you can feel people's kind of intentions sometimes, or you get a different. And maybe it's not always completely accurate, but sometimes you get a different feeling coming off of people, right, than what they're trying to present. And a lot of people do that, right? They try to portray their, their themselves as something other than their identity, but sometimes some people try too hard, you know? So I find it hard being around people like that sometimes. So I'm the kind of per person that a lot of people like to walk up to and tell me stuff, personal stuff. And especially now that I know how I can, how people can affect me which affects everybody to a certain degree. It's not just me being special. I'm not saying that at all. If you're listening to me, you're probably likely somebody like that as well. That's probably why you kind of drive with me, listen to me. But anyways, um, yeah, so well, she's in the gym right now and I'm out here just recording in the car. But um, yeah, so if we have, a, so let's say me, me and Speaker have a contract that I'm not allowed to do something and they changed a the rule or maybe I just got away with it for almost four years now or at least four years maybe five years now doing these podcasts putting this music on there and all of a sudden someone decided someone who doesn't like me said oh yeah i'm gonna fucking gonna rat him out copyright infringement blah 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 because it always happens on youtube youtube gives you you know like what level you did it at you know is it red is it yellow is it just small sometimes your video gets straight up blocked like one time i went to use a clip from disney i think it was and it was like it was, yeah, The Little Mermaid. It was only, uh, it was Ursula singing The Witch Song. And I ended up doing just the audio, I think, for that. But, and got around it that way. But, what happened was, uh, I got shit up blocked. Like, my video, my entire video was blocked because of that one clip. 
so I had to take that clip out, and then I was able to do it. Uh, I don't know how I got around that. I think on the podcast, I'm still able to put the audio. I don't think YouTube, I wasn't able to do anything, though. Whereas when I have a song on my podcast and my podcast goes to YouTube, like the one song, which I think was the start in all this, Sound of Silence, which I love that song, by the way, and it's not to rip anybody off. It's just such a powerful song that I want people to also feel that, and it kind of helps get in the right sentiment for my podcast. The music I put on my podcast is for a specific reason. It's for the emotion that I want people to kind of be drawn to or in whenever they're listening to my podcast, most of the time anyways. And that's why sometimes you'll see a big variety, a big change, because the next segment that's coming on, I have a different... Anyways, doesn't matter. But, so me and Spreaker are in a contract that I'm not allowed to do that. Well, four years later, I'm still doing the same thing, and then all of a sudden I get the infringement, so that was kind of fucked up. But they got to change their policies, and it's up to me to read my emails. But I didn't get a notification, like I said, or nothing. Just one little fucking vague statement on my dashboard. So I didn't even know this happened until... If I never looked at my dashboard, I wouldn't know. I could have kept making fucking podcasts. And the dashboard's like on Safari on like their Spreaker website. It's not even in my app. My app doesn't pop up with a notification, which it does if I didn't pay my bill. Or they shouldn't get, if they went to my account and there's no money there for paying for my subscription, I'd have a notification. But for this, for them to stop my monetization, for the money they have to pay me, I don't even get that much. So that's what I don't like. And the fact that, you know, YouTube spells it right out for me what I fucking did wrong. Whereas this was just copyright infringement. You you are suspended from the monetization program. Contact us if you want to reinstate that. It's like, wow, what's the infringement? What did I do? How did I, you know, I need to know. If I broke the contract, that's fine. And they're well within their rights to stop me from getting the monetization program. But they need to let me know what the fuck I did wrong. that state that I can't use other copyright uh, claims or other copyrighted um, anything that belongs to somebody else that I don't want permission to use. If I use that, then that that um, puts me in default or it's uh, reprimandable by no longer being um, in the monetization program. That's fine. So if that's what I did, that's cool. But I want to know like what, what it is. You know what I mean? I'm not going to sit here and just guess and just be like, oh, okay. It's okay. Keep my money, Spreaker. It's like, no, no. What episode is it that I have the copyright claim on? Is it multiple? Is it one? Is it many? And if so, all the monetization for all the other episodes that didn't get that, am I eligible to that? Is there a contract stating that I'm just no longer eligible to any of the money I've already occurred? Or like what's going on? And that's what I mean. That's what that's what's pissing me off. And the fact that Spreaker is normally pretty quick. Um, there was a couple times where I was supposed to get paid at the end of the month and then I didn't get paid. I messaged them. And then, you know, sometimes I think the longest it took the one day was six to eight hours for them to respond to me but within the same day. And I'm already past that now. You know, and it's three messages later and I'm still no answer. So that's what I don't like. And then literally, and it's not like it just said, stated like uh, you're no longer in the monetization program. Suspension will be permanent until this time or whatever the case is. We're reviewing your shit and we'll get to you. It said if you want to be reinstated or I forget how they worded it, but it's like contact us. It literally said to contact them. So I contacted them three different ways. And one directly through, through the contact us, and then the other two from other ways, just so that we get their attention faster. It's still no reply, so that's just kind of pissing me off. But nonetheless, I'll keep going. But that's what I mean. Like for example, for the payment, if for if I didn't, uh, they went to go take the money out of the account and it wasn't there. They would. They always tell me, I get a notification saying they tried to take the payment, it wasn't there, they're going to try again. I think the next day or the next day, or if I need to contact them, whatever, contact them. But there's a notification right away, and I see it right in my speaker app and on the dashboard under the notification settings. And it will literally tell me, or if it tried three times and it still didn't come out yet, then I won't be able to use my speaker. But right now, I can use my speaker, I can make a podcast, they'll get the monetization i won't get fuck all and if i didn't check my dashboard i wouldn't even know that something was going on that's that feels dirty that's what that feels like now one second i'm in breach i'm in breach of the contract or whatever but what i'm trying to say right now here is they tell me i'm in breach but they haven't told me how i breached that's like saying 
here's a fine for for speeding but i'm not going to tell you where i saw you speeding i'm not going to show you the gun and i'm not going to tell you where it was we caught you speeding you know what i mean that's what it feels like it's like what the fuck you gotta let me know this shit you know if you're telling me I breached my contract, you can tell me where the contract, what part of the contract I breached, and what I did. Just saying copyright infringement doesn't mean shit. To me, I could be like, no, I own all this. You know what I mean? And maybe I contacted Disturber and the label of Disturbed and spoke to them and asked them permission and have a sign, um, a signed contract or agreement with their, their uh, label saying I can use that song. You know what I mean? So that's my issue and it's already been two days i'm not getting monetized and we're about to start day three here you know and that's the thing the monetization is not just for my newest episode it's for every single episode for all what am i at? close to 300 episodes now so every episode up until whichever one i breached in is making money to this right right now as we speak people are watching my shit right now and i'm not getting that monetization because they said I breached, but they haven't told me how. You know what I mean? So they have all the power in this, but they're not doing it correctly. And I know quite a bit about contract law. And I know how they can default. So, and I like Spreaker, so I don't want to do anything rash. But my next step, if I don't hear an answer from them, is going to be put them on notice for the way they're defaulting. And I'm going to null and void the breach they're saying I did. Now what I did is still a breach of contract nonetheless, and that's valid. But what they're doing can also allow me to not have to pay for a couple months of service. So this is why it's important to know shit, you know? And I'm not, and you can say, well, he's just talking on his ass. He's pretending he knows. No, I'm telling you right now, I've gotten away with quite a bit of stuff from collections agencies to, um, to simple little contracts, to payday loans, to you know, so much because of these little, these little, areas in contract law that if you know a little bit about it you can do a lot but you also know how to have to know the proper procedure you have to go about it the right way which is a nice segue into what we're going to talk about today what are we going to talk about today well I was as a result of my last video what i talked about um, i talked about personal responsibility um, i talked about how when you stop believing in a god or whatever your spiritual belief is that you're programmed from a kid it could be anything normally in my circles and where i am normally it's christianity or a judeo-christian sometimes islam but sometimes um you know one of these main ones normally it's breaking away from that and starting a newer spiritual path that is more occult esoteric um more what's the word i'm looking for more maybe mythology based more deity based it's the belief of knowing that you can use deities to your benefit but these things that we've deified and personified over time are actually energies within us is one way to state it i guess um and which is probably the best way it's going to benefit you but 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 having these things personified and deified and turned into gods is actually something very empowering meaning your program as a kid to know that there's this god in the sky and if right now you have that subconscious belief inside of you deep inside you that there's a god up there it's going to punish you if you're bad or give you good stuff if you're good therefore if that's your belief what you can do one second here Home, I guess it's called things that was upstairs in the bathroom and my four-year-old sleeping and I didn't want her to wake up So I had to deal with that anyways um, So having that subconscious belief of whatever it is that you were programmed as In lots of spiritual communities today. We're trying to say a lot of people are saying to get rid of that belief Get it, get it gone get it out of you but what I was trying to prove was when that happens nihilism can fall um can fall upon you at that point because then you start which i've spent many episodes podcasts and videos speaking on how fear-based media is the beginning part of spirituality i believe that wholeheartedly 
I believe that when you start going down the fear base conspiracy hole, you start seeing all these things that start going and disproving that God is real and you start going down the hole that, you know, God is dead, there is no God, blah, 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 blah. Knowing that there was, never was a God, okay, consciously, if you do this enough and it gets into your subconscious mind, it basically kills the God in your subconscious mind. Therefore, you can become very nihilistic. Nothing fucking matters, you know? And sometimes I can mimic being depolarized, but depolarized is like a choice of not being attached to anything for or against versus um, nihilistic is very good. It mimics that, but it's more like, what the fuck's the point? And then you can make bad decisions and you can get rid of personal responsibility. Whereas today, I want to talk about personal responsibility a little bit more and the benefits and how you can change the world. And as a result of what just, what my last episode was, um, Russell Brand is someone who I've subscribed to because I've got a lot in common with the man from the addiction problem to going into spirituality and to blah, 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 blah. Um, his newest video was very, very great. And at the risk of, you know, what I've just been talking about happened to me on Spreaker, you know, whatever it is as it is, I'm gonna play a little bit of that for you so you can hear what he says. He talks about QAnon, he talks about 9-11 conspiracies, he talks about COVID vaccines, he talks about a lot of those hot topics right now. But I like what he's talking about. And there's only one small thing I would switch at the end of what he's trying to get at and holding some upper ups accountable for some of this stuff. Um, and there's one thing I would change and then I'm gonna go switch to a Peterson clip after that to show you what he means someone asked him a question about something and the answer he got was very empowering and proof of how you can change your life and the world by starting from the microcosm working your way up to the macrocosm um and that's kind of what i just want to get into here today and it's going to be a i guess be a part two of what i was talking about last time and i'm going to keep giving you more examples of why how when God is dead within you, you can just flip that to be a good thing because then you can become the God once you know that. And you don't necessarily need to remove your subconscious God. Whatever you were programmed with, all you have to do is learn how to tweak it consciously. Meaning, say the right things consciously. And put that God to work. That's deep in your subconscious and get that God to manifest stuff for you. Because once again, it's just a symbolic representation. Magic is getting stuff into your subconscious mind to play out in your reality. So if in your subconscious mind you have a Godhead there, okay, well what you need to do is slightly tweak some of that programming. This is why learning about, like I said, the Greek deities and the Roman deities and all these different deities, having all these different names for the same person. Yeah, instead of having just one God who does everything, you break it down into seven. But it doesn't matter, even if you have that one God in there, consciously, you can break that one God down into seven. But when you do your ritual, you put that God to work. You can use the words of the Bible, you know. Anyways, but that's what I'm going to get into. I'm going to show you how to do that in this video. I teach how to do that in this video. How to put your already subconscious mind that's already been programmed. And how to use it in ritual and symbolic messages and get it into your subconscious and get that fucker to work for you. Because of the deity doesn't matter if it's real or not none of these deities are really real like as in historically a real character that lives up once upon a time they're not real in that sense whatsoever but they are real because they're living in your mind right now they're in their own little deity world right now and that deity world is in our astral plane which mimics everything here in this physical plane therefore what you affect on that astral plane will filter down into this plane that's another way you can look at how magic works. So whatever deity that you know you have in your head, now that part's gonna be on you. So I'll use whatever example I use. If I use Christianity and Old Testament versus New Testament or Jesus or some of the saints, whatever the case is in there, whatever one I use, you gotta flip that to your personal experience. So if that's same as mine, Roman Catholic, then you can use exactly the examples I use. But if it's here Islam or Judaism or a different, 
religion altogether that I've never mentioned. You're going to have to find the different correspondences. But it's the same concept. You just got to find the right correspondences. Because then Jesus can correspond to Jupiter. Whereas God of the Old Testament can correspond to sometimes Mars, sometimes Saturn, but other times other things. Mary, praying to Mary, can be like the moon, the mother. But the month of May, and there's certain prayers you can say to Mary to help the uh, flowers grow and shit like that, which could be a correspondent to Venus. But if you have Mary in your mind, if you did a bunch of Hail Marys as a kid, then you can use Mary, you can make a candle to Mary, put the Venus symbol on there too, though, but put it to Mary, and you can manifest something using that. And I'm 100% in complete belief of that. Now you don't have to do right, just Mary. You can do like I do, get a green candle. Depending if, you, if you're using Mary for the moon, then use a blue candle. If you're using it for something earthly, like bringing in money, use a green candle. And write Mary, but write Venus, write Aphrodite, write Frigg, write Frida, write, um, shit. What's the other names? Oh, Astarte, um, is it Ayana? Um, there's a Mesopotamian name and uh, a Sumerian name. One's Inanna and one's Ayana. One is for the moon and one is for Venus and they're so close. But one of those, you put all those names on that candle. And then I am grateful for whatever the fuck it is that you want. Now if it has something to do with the moon and water and the emotions or your emotions in your body or your emotional state. Or maybe you just want to cast for the ability to use your emotions. To amplify your emotions to make magic work better. You can do that too. I mean, using Jupiter is a good way to get money because money uh, corresponds to currency, current, you know, there's water current, you know, um, banks, the river banks, um, you know, there's a bunch of different words I can play on, but I can't think of them right off the end on the top of my head. But using Jupiter and Venus, or even the moon and Venus, can really help get you financial currency. But if you're programmed, a simple little change, okay? You put all those deities like the Venus and all that shit that you consciously are starting to believe in and you like, but you throw in Mary in there or something like that. Or if you're using Jupiter, you throw Jesus on that candle too just to hit that part of your subconscious and it will work. I'm telling you, you don't need to buy a program from anybody. You don't need to do anything. You simply start using this technique. It's going to take a little bit of time because it's not that it has to get into your mind, which it does. But at the same time, you're going to have to practice the setting it and letting it go and not thinking about it, like waiting for it to manifest. That's the hardest part. Once you have absolute faith, once you have a few manifestations that take you however long it takes you, a month, two months, three months, who knows, however long it takes you. Once you have a bunch of those that manifested, you're going to get in the habit of doing like I do. Every night you do a different candle. You write on it, you have absolute faith that that's going to happen. And then down the road it happens. And then you just have a specific book like I do and you mark it down as they happen. See, I don't necessarily write the, the spells I do anymore. Like when I'm actually manifesting. Like when I write it on my candle, I'm almost done. I do it off the top of my head. But I can remember what I, I'm like that. I have that good, I don't know if it's muscle memory, but it's whatever memory it is. A good memory. And it's like, as soon as that thing manifests, I'm like, oh yeah, I did a candle for that last week. Or I did a candle for that two days ago. So then I just write down the manifestation now. But before that, I used to write down the things I was trying to manifest. Because as it's written, so it shall be done. It's another layer of magic by writing it down. But when you write it down, you write it down as if it's already happened. You don't say, I did a candle to manifest this. No. I am so grateful that... I did a candle for this and it manifested. Or I'm so grateful that this has manifested. And then when it does, you just do a simple check mark or something. You know what I mean? Something like that. But this way you have an extra layer. Because so whatever you write down can manifest. You just need the programming that know that's true. Know that's true. And if you have Bible programming in you, then you already have that in you, which is the great news. So don't take that out. Keep that in there. But just consciously know that it's not fact. Just consciously know that that book is meant to teach you. But on top of that, you can become a witch or a wizard or a magician who still have a Christian faith. And you can still use that to your benefit. Now, that's not what I do. Because there's a lot of things that the church has done that I don't necessarily believe in. And there's a lot of things they do and tell people 
you know, it's like preach love and treat everybody whatever. But then at the same time, it's like, well, those fuckers are bad. Or that other church down there thinks differently on this and we don't like that. It's like, who cares? You know, if you really were preaching what God and Jesus wanted you to preach, why would that shit matter? But anyways, let's move on to Russell Brand before I get into too much of this. And then I'll elaborate more on this later if I can. You into the presidency of Joe Biden. What is the role of QAnon and the ideas upon which it is built? There has been an awakening. Have you felt it? Supporters of QAnon were out in full force at present. It's called QAnon, a fringe conspiracy theory that some political analysts have likened to an online religion. I know if you're a person who's into those theories, you'll say no, it's not a conspiracy because there's proof. Well, in this video, we'll look at what there is tangible proof for, some of which is pretty nefarious and troubling and shows where the concentration of power is and what is speculative or as it would be referred to by detractors of QAnon, baseless theories. Followers believe that a cabal runs the United States. They control the media, Hollywood, and politicians. And the only person that can stop them is Donald Trump. Some of the figures that the QAnon narrative features are like Hillary Clinton, she comes up a lot, Barack Obama, George Soros, Bill Gates, Tom Hanks, Oprah Winfrey, Chrissy Teigen, Pope Francis. So sort of powerful and prominent figures. These people are taking an oath to QAnon. Where we go one, we go home. Where we go one, we go home. When you see that there, you see loads of people believe in QAnon theories. The same way loads of people will just say, what I see on the mainstream news, that's enough for me. You know, you vote for the Democrats or you vote for the Republicans. That's all there is. Well, that's not my position. I recognise that if you feel you have no agency, that it doesn't matter who you vote for, you'll get the same results, that there's nothing you can do politically that's going to mean that your personal life is going to change, that you're going to be able to do what you want with your family, feed your family better, spend more time with your family, live a better, more meaningful life. For me, that creates an environment where I do become cynical, and suspicious. Here's how many posts there were over the two years before the pandemic. And then in March, this happened. On Facebook, in just four months, membership of the biggest public QAnon groups rose by 700%. One of the most famous conspiracies is that 9-11 was an inside job. That's a difficult subject to talk about. Once on a mainstream news show, I was asked about it and I said something along the lines of, I don't trust the government. And that was used to preclude me from participating in political debate for a long time subsequently. Like respected thinkers like Noam Chomsky, who could hardly be called an establishment figure, has said there's absolutely no evidence at all that 9-11 was an inside job, right? That's Noam Chomsky. But John Pilger talked about how in the late 90s, 1999 specifically, there were discussions for which there is evidence that America needed to have a catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. This became known as the project for the new American century. Bob Woodward, of course, famous for his work on exposing the Watergate scandal, reveals how the events of 9-11 were manipulated. On the morning of the 12th of September, 2001, without any evidence of who the hijackers were, Donald Rumsfeld, a senior figure in the Bush administration, demanded the US attack Iraq. According to Woodward, Rumsfeld told a cabinet meeting that Iraq should be a principal target of the first round in the war against terrorism. Iraq was temporarily spared only because Colin Powell, the Secretary of State, persuaded Bush that public opinion has to be prepared before a move against Iraq is possible. So whilst there's no evidence that 9-11 was an inside job, some immovable, like, ratified evidence. What we do know, what there's evidence of around 9-11 is, in response to 9-11, US government sanctioned the collection of telephone and internet records of tens and millions of Americans by the NSA as uncovered by Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden wasn't pardoned by Donald Trump. Edward Snowden wasn't pardoned by Barack Obama. So there you have like a significant piece of evidence upon which you can say, hey, I don't trust the government and it doesn't matter whether the Democrats or the Republicans are in power. No one's doing anything about a genuine, legit hero like Snowden who exposed information that the government was spying without permission on ordinary citizens. So for me, that's what interests me about anti-establishment thinking. Some relatives find it especially hard to deal with a QAnon belief that the pandemic 
is a hoax. Here's another idea that's very popular and it falls under the QAnon banner that Bill Gates created coronavirus in a secret lab and is making vaccines a requisite in order to implant microchips into people. Yuval Noah Harari says, we should not dismiss conspiracy theories too easily as they often represent deep and sometimes justified fears that humans have. One such theory that the COVID-19 virus was created with the idea to implant people with computer chips to control them is ridiculous, but represents a realistic fear of surveillance technology, which is one of the consequences of the pandemic. What we know is that the coronavirus pandemic has seen cooperation between governments and big tech to increase public surveillance, as well as speed up digital changes such as remote learning and e-health. In New York, former Google chief executive Eric Schmidt is leading a panel tasked with technologically transforming the city. Bill Gates has also been called in to help and create a smarter education system. Even Naomi Klein said in her recent article about Davos and the Great Reset that the amount of power and influence that Bill Gates has is troubling. There are many very well documented cases of Bill Gates's philanthropy. He's continually referred to in most media as a philanthropist and the work of his foundation is continually lauded. But here are some other facts about Bill Gates's foundation that I'd never heard before. I don't know if you had. The Gates Foundation is the largest donor to the World Health Organization, which some researchers argue gives Gates a disproportionate influence on global health with little accountability. An unelected leader making decisions about public policy and public priorities without any public discussion or political process. Furthermore, Gates has made no mention of his foundation's investment in any pharmaceutical companies working on COVID. The foundation refused to provide details about its current investment portfolio. And when writing about what he thought government leaders should be doing to tackle COVID in the New England Journal of Medicine, he does not disclose the details of his financial ties. Gates filled out the journal's required conflict of interest form but simply listed his conflicts as numerous, giving readers no sense of the size, scope or type of his financial stake in the pandemic. The Gates Foundation is littered with former employees from big pharmaceutical companies such as Merck, Novartis, Pfizer and GlaxoSmithKline. The Gates Foundation also invests in these corporations, directly holding stakes in drug companies including Merck, GSK, Eli Lilly, Pfizer, Novartis and Sanofi. Critics have said a key role that Gates has played in the pandemic has been elevating the pharmaceutical industry, for example, pushing the University of Oxford to deliver its leading COVID-19 vaccine platform into the hands of Big Pharma. The resulting partnership with AstraZeneca had another effect, as Bloomberg reported, changing the university's distribution model from an open license platform designed to make its vaccine freely available for any manufacturer to an exclusive license controlled by AstraZeneca. Various pharmaceutical companies have been given legal indemnity by both the UK and US governments, guarding them against liability for side effects from coronavirus vaccines. Donald Trump boasted that his administration cut through every piece of red tape to achieve the fastest ever by far launch of a vaccine trial. I suppose the value of a list like that is to demonstrate that within the realm of public record, there is sufficient financial activity to cause concern without recourse to ideas that are more difficult to prove and for which there is no evidence that I know of. The Gates Foundation has also influenced news coverage of global health policy, donating millions to major media outlets, including NPR, PBS, ABC, BBC, Al Jazeera, The Telegraph, The Financial Times, Univision, and The Guardian. So my position is I have a sense that there are deep state and corporate relationships that influence policy and impact in a significant way the lives of ordinary people. Certainly there is sufficient provable, demonstrable stuff to suggest there needs to be radical change in the way that we run the world. And I can understand why people would have doubts, suspicions, and why a territory for speculation would be created. But what has always interested me is the actual way that very powerful interests operate and collaborate. That, in a literal sense, is a form of conspiracy without recourse to these rather more esoteric and some would say peculiar assertions around uh, occultism. As America watched President Biden take the oath of office, QAnon followers were waiting for the Great Awakening. Many of them believe that the inauguration was a carefully planned setup where Democrats would be arrested and Donald Trump would start a second term in office. I also have trouble believing that Donald Trump is in a kind of uh, heroic 
role in this situation just because some of some of the policies that were implemented during the four years that he was in government. Whilst Trump has often been critical of big tech during his presidency, Donald Trump's 1.5 trillion tax cuts helped billionaires pay a lower tax rate than the working class for the first time in history. The tax package meant the top 0.1% of US households were granted a 2.5% tax cut that pushed their rate below that of the lower 50% of US earners. So that's one of the things I'm curious about. I sometimes enjoyed Trump's rhetoric, his performance style, the way he attacked the establishment. But at heart, I don't think that Trump was a figure whose interests were, how can we help ordinary people have a better life? This sounds so crazy, and I recognize how crazy this sounds, but I don't believe Joe Biden's going to be sworn in as president today. In Under the Skin last week, we spoke to Jonathan Haidt. Human nature is 90% chimp and 10% bee. We're like chimps in being primates whose minds were shaped by the relentless competition of individuals with their neighbors, but we're like bees in being ultra social creatures whose minds were shaped by the relentless competition of groups with other groups. We are descended from earlier humans whose groupish minds helped them cohere, cooperate and outcompete other groups. My hypothesis, says Jonathan Haidt, is that human beings are conditional hive creatures. We have the ability under special conditions to transcend self-interest and lose ourselves temporarily and ecstatically in something larger than ourselves. That's a really brilliant theory by him. And I suppose what I get from looking at this analysis is we are living in conditions now that are so detached from those for which we are evolved. With Russia, with the Nazi party and, and China under Mao's, which is funny how this all happened around the same time period. See, we all kind of evolved together, even if we're on different parts of the planet, um, different countries and different continents. But it's like, uh, anyways, doesn't matter. But what I'm saying was when people lost their belief in God, whenever science proved that God couldn't, Jesus couldn't have came to earth and resurrected and all that, that there was no historical Jesus, science, archaeology, you know, all these things, carbon dating, all these different things, ways to prove that it was an actual fact, okay? People lost that belief. And they were so, you know, people started falling into nihilism. And as a result of that, when introduced with an idea, no matter how crazy the idea was, they needed something to grab onto, wanted something to hold on to. And you compare that to what he just said, that one guy just said about COVID-19 putting computer chips in our bloodstreams and all that, how that's a ridiculous idea. Yes, there is the COVID um, vaccine that will change your DNA, but there's no microchips going inside of us. Now, I can't say for sure that's true or not true, but from what I read and looked at, that's a pretty big stretch. We're not there yet. Um, and once again, we don't, they don't need to put microchips in us to do anything like that. They have our minds already controlled if they wanted to. They have us already bugged and they have us on our phones 24-7. I mean, they can listen, points, whatever they want to hear, whatever we're doing. There'd be no purpose for doing that. But that's not what I'm here to debate because I don't want to start breaking down anybody's new belief system that is this and then they start freaking out. Or what I said, because once again, I can't prove it is or isn't real either, right? I only have my intuitive notions and the shit I looked up on both sides of the fence. But the point is, um, people grab onto these things because um, they want someone to believe in. They want something to believe in because they lost their, their initial belief. When a child loses their, their belief in, you know, who? The guy that comes around on the 25th of December, you know? They have nothing to believe in anymore. You know, some kids go wholeheartedly into the religion at that point. Some kids get nihilistic, some kids get depressed. Well, think about that on an adult scale, you know? q and people jumped on that. When everybody was at home and sad and didn't know what was going on with the world, people were already into conspiracy, but they had work to kind of distract them for most of the point, most of the time. But they were starting to dive into some spiritual or some conspiracy stuff. And all of a sudden they're at home all the time. They see everything taking a turn for the worse. They see gurus and people out there talking about these conspiracies. You know, I have nothing against Ralph Smart. And I, I, I think he's done a lot of good and helped a lot of people come to spirituality and all that. But I don't watch him anymore, to be honest. Um, I, I just, I don't want to keep going down these same rabbit holes of 
conspiracy and George Orwell and we're in 1984 and you know they're trying to fuck us and but we already won but they're you know all that repetition of talking about how culprits um they're trying to harm us is not good for anybody to have constantly going into their mind in reality so it was nothing against him because he's helped me out in so many ways um there's a lot of things i didn't know until i looked at him like i found the seven hermetic principles even before i got into magic and i'm still watching his videos i found the emerald tablets um from from his videos um i decided to go walk between him and santos Minacci. i decided to go um plant-based vegan well vegetarian mostly because i'm still eating eggs and cheese but i decided to do that um partly from him partly from santos Minacci. so a world of gratitude to Ralph smart but same with santos too uh i still watch him from time to time some of his older stuff same with ralph i watch some of his older videos but i don't watch his newer stuff anymore because i don't need the repetition of how COVID-19 is a conspiracy to do all this bad stuff because I'm trying to not have that as a reality. I'm trying to actually eradicate that as a reality. I'm trying to help get things back to not necessarily a normal, but I want my reality anyways. I try to affect my life at the microcosmic level. The things I can affect on the grand scale thing, you can work your way up to be able to affect things on the grand scale, but you have to start with the things you can control within your own life. So, listen to somebody always constantly tell me that, you know, the government and different inorganic beings and different things like that are trying to, you know, mind fuck me all the time, which, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of proof of stuff like that. But in the same sense, I don't think it's to the extent that he makes it be. I think there is a lot of persuasion going on for our minds to sway our minds to for shopping for corporate greed for to not have us to keep us separated so we never unite you know i think there's a lot of that, that happens but i don't think it's to the extent because you know the people that are on top need the people that are on the bottom so that they can stay on top because all the people are on the bottom are gone they have nowhere to be on top of if that's something everybody needs to understand these guys that are so-called on top of the pyramid can't get rid of the bottom of the pyramid. They need us so they can be on top of the pyramid. They want us around. They're not trying to kill us off. They are trying to keep us there. We want you to stay exactly where you are so we can stay exactly where we are. That's how they want it. It's not to kill us all off so it's only them left. Because then they're going to end up keeping the pyramid. These higher hierarchical stru structures that we have within our life been around a lot longer than most things okay everything is anyways but the point i was trying to get at was you can kind of see the transition you know history always repeats itself and right now we're in a time where a lot of conspiracy a lot of people have lost their their religious beliefs and depending on how often they watch stuff that says that you know Catholic Church is this, and if they were programmed as a kid to believe in God, and they're watching all this stuff that says Catholic Church is evil and all that, but then they have reprogrammed their subconscious mind that Catholicism, what they were programmed with, is the real evil. You know what I mean? And depending if they're QAnon or whatever, that's the good now. You know, they switched the whole polarity up. They jumped on something. But before they had something to jump onto, like QAnon or whatever the case was, were in maybe nihilistic mode. They were kind of like depressed and sad. Like, man, the thing is, as we learn, we're lied to. There's all these rich fucks out there just trying to harm us, blah, 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 blah. And they find this grand idea, QAnon, you know? This guy's going to save us. It's, it's, that's why they compare it to religion. And I have nothing against anybody who was part of that, who found that, who found, you know, some, some belief and purpose and meaning out of their life when they jumped onto that. But I don't want to see anybody else get harmed anymore. And that's why I'm trying to talk about the things I'm going to talk about, whether they're popular or unpopular, whether I'm monetized or not, it doesn't matter. What I'm just trying to do is just trying to help people. And you don't have to get rid of your beliefs completely to manifest your life. Because, and you can say, well, how is that when everybody's saying a religious program is going to stop for manifesting? Well, here's the thing. Everybody's manifesting whether they know it or not right now. And I can play... I can play all the gurus that say that. You know, and there's some gurus that will literally say it's the opposite. They'll say, in the one sentence, they'll say you're manifesting what, what? You're manifesting everything in your life right now. You're either cursing yourself or you're blessing yourself. 
you know, everything that is happening in your life is a result of your programming. And then they'll tell you, yeah, yeah, you gotta get rid of your religious program and do it accurately. I think what they're trying to say is the best way to take control of your life is to not give your power away to Catholicism anymore. Give your power away to any ideology, any belief system, anything like that. Because, you know, truth be told, Frederick Xavier will say this, you know, the church wants you to come there and believe what they want to believe. You know what I mean? The priest communes with God. You can pray to God too. But, you know, it used to be like the priest was the only one that communed with God. You had to go see him to speak to God. Whereas the older pagan religions was you can directly commune with the spirits and the gods and all that shit, which you commune into that part of yourself. But the point is, you know, give your power away to them. But if you're already programmed that there's this spiritual realm somewhere, if you come in contact with that, you can manifest things into the here. Like if you pray to God for something, he'll give it to you, you know. Oh, my family member's sick, or you go pray to God or whatever for God to answer you. Well, if you do that properly, it's gonna work. Well, and you can be a devout Catholic, or you can be someone who's on the edge who's not sure what to believe. But if you do it properly, it'll fucking work. And that's what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say maybe you don't have to break down all your beliefs completely. Maybe you could shift your conscious mind a bit to understand things in a different perspective. But keep those subconscious beliefs in there and use them to your benefit. And that's what I'm trying to teach. So anyways. But I think what Russell Brand said there... Is kind of echoes on what my episode was about last time was that people are so desperate right now because we, we can't touch each other, we can't go well with a fucking mask on, we can't do all these other events and you know, all these other ways we used to unwind, you know, this human connection. We lost all that. On top of that, there's a lot of people kind of get nihilistic because they don't have their belief in, in God anymore and and this other realm and all that. So it's like, what the fuck? The world's going to hell and hell in a hand basket, basically. What do we do? And so they like to jump on something that gives their life meaning. It gives, makes them feel powerful again. makes them have a purpose. You know what I mean? But I think that's the wrong way to go about it. Trying to change things on such a big scale like that. When there's so many things within your own reality, your own life right now. That if you start changing those, then you work your way up that ladder. And you'll see how much power you get a result of it. And I'm going to prove that point whenever I put a clip from Peterson on. But uh, since I interrupted Russell, let's put Russell back on. But we've become lost. That power has become too concentrated. Many of us are living lives detached from meaning. And in order to counteract these doubtless powerful forces we need to hold those very powerful forces accountable and create alternative systems ourselves where we have real agency real control over our own lives do you feel like you've been duped that you've been tricked i was just kind of in shock and i thought i had to reevaluate everything the way my life was going to be now because it's so it's so different than I, my expectations i suppose why I'm sympathetic to people that have anti-establishment ideas is because they chime with my own ideas about power and also because I recognize at heart there is a real appetite for change and that changes because there is a lot of suffering and a lot of people feeling real pain and isolation and alienation and an understandable dearth of hope because politics as we surely know by now operates at the behest of powerful interests and the alterations that take place at that level are not significant or meaningful for ordinary people and this merely enhances that sense of desperation and loneliness and I think in that space people are willing to believe in anything so I understand this man's sense of loss and hopelessness and confusion. I believe that this is a real thing. Reptilian aliens, uh, people in our government who are working towards a deep state. What QAnon is, is just an amalgamation of all of the greatest conspiracy theories thrown into one big um, belief. Let's get all them conspiracy theories together, thrown into one big belief. I think it's more important to focus on what can be demonstrated and proven and what are we going to do as an alternative. 
when I was much more famous, there were even videos about me saying, oh, he's a handler, he's Katy Perry's handler. And people all the time ask about this 33 tattoo. That's because I like the number and I like Jesus. And because I've been the subject of this kind of conspiratorial accusation, it means that I'm a little cautious around it. Also, because I've been a public figure for a long time, I've been on the TV talking about being anti-establishment a long, long time ago, by the way. You know, so I'm cautious about the way I approach these conversations. Do you know why? Because I'm interested in change. I believe it's possible to organise society in a different way, but that will not be possible unless you hold powerful interests accountable. And unfortunately, in order to do that, you have to play by a certain set of rules. You have to demonstrate factually what can be proven. And let me tell you, there is no Unfortunately, dirt. in order to do that, you have to play by a certain set of rules. You have to demonstrate factually what can be proven. And let me tell you, there is no and this is kind of what I meant here. You have to do it correctly with factual things. And this is one of the things that Thunder Wizard promotes that I think is actually really worth listening when he talks about his critical thinking and looking at stuff from both sides. Um, whatever conspiracy, whatever theory, whatever spirituality, whatever you're looking at. Which I don't think he does a good job of when he's talking about Western magic. But nonetheless, when it comes to these conspiracy theories and stuff like that, where you're trying to prove that there's an evil cabal, or that our heads of state aren't have our best interests at heart, instead of just going out there and running with these outlandish, really far-fetched theories, which who knows, maybe some of them are true. I'm not saying they're not. But what I am saying is you really need to do it the proper way if you do want to get anywhere. Now, I think it's more beneficial to start with your own life. Start with the things that you can fix within your life. Because if you're at home or you're off from work or you're just getting in, getting either in or out of high school or you know, you're know you retired and you're looking into the stuff and you know you want to do something about it, well, you can. But to try to touch those higher ups somewhere in Washington or whatever, whatever conspiracy you're chasing, you need to start at the smallest level and work your way up. But nonetheless, if you if you want to just bring attention to this, if it's something very important to you, then you should really, really consider doing the research on both sides and follow the proper order. I think he if he hasn't said it yet, he's about to. He says, whatever system or something to the effect of this, that there's a system in play here, and you have to use that system to break down that system. You would have to use their go by their rules to do it. And I think that was one of the things that you know intrigued people about QAnon because the way it was happening, the way it was set up, and I don't know much about it, so I won't, I won't lie. But from what I heard with the Twitter and the codes and uh, how it was going to happen and how they, you know, when they thought at the inauguration that uh, Biden was going to not be sworn in and Trump was going to do his second term, it was out of tradition, it wasn't following these rules, and that's what everybody was against was. Um, like he said, I think everybody is in need for change. And so even if it went against all the rules of the Constitution and all this stuff, people were okay with that idea because of the fact that they wanted change so bad that they didn't care if we got the change outside of the rules and laws and regulations that we're supposed to follow. Like I didn't follow the rules with my podcast only with the monetization program, which are going to work all that out, right? But they didn't follow the rules proper procedure for letting me know how when or what i did wrong therefore you know we have to have a conversation a dialogue or else you know we're both gonna have to put a notice and both defaulting our contract well if you want to go after anybody you really need to do both sides it's a digging on both sides of the story you gotta put aside what your goal is momentarily and just say okay i'm gonna fucking find out everything that the people that are against this idea are talking about in find the facts that back that up and see how legit some of these facts are. And then you're gonna go for all the people that are for this idea and then follow those facts and see which ones are more realistic. And then you can pick up your belief after and then see how you feel about it. You know what I mean? That would be the best way. And you present it as that. And you can even start off by saying, hey, this is my belief, but this is what I fucking found. And you're gonna find out I think you're going to find out of that. At the end of the day, you're going to see that we were just pawns. That both sides, if you go far enough down, you see that both sides are really working at the same goal. And it's just to keep us in the same spot. Not together, not on each other's side. 
you know, helping one another out. That we just stay always in conflict with one another. You know, keep us all in these little groups. Sometimes the groups get big, but there's still another bigger group out there that's opposed to that group. You know, the Bloods, the Crips, you know, fucking KKK, you know, the, any, all these stupid fucking racist or, or dumb groups. I'm not saying Bloods or Crips or KKK or any. I'm not trying to... God, fuck, I'm losing my fucking train of thought here. But point is, let's keep us all fighting. You know what I mean? Let's keep us all fighting with each other. It doesn't matter if you're for or against. They want you either for or against. So that we never could unite and actually fix these problems and do what Russell Brennan is proposing and hold these people accountable for keeping us pinned up against each other. See, when it comes right down to it, it's not the conspiracy that matters. It's controlling the opinions and the minds and the perspective and the beliefs and the emotions of the people so that they remain at the top of that pyramid and we remain at the bottom of the pyramid. That is what you would become in the flame. And the reason why I say that is because that's what I found out when I did this. And that's why I have the opinion and the stance that I have now. It's not for lack of just not picking a side, just not to pick a side. It's because I research both sides. Because I have Saturn and Libra, the scales. I have Saturn there. And I'm always, well, on this side, you know, I, I can see why people are for that. But on this side, I can see why people are against that. You know what I mean? So, it's also my seventh house. Seven, you know, the number of Saturn. Anyways, doesn't matter. Yeah, I think I said that there. I'll go back to Russell. There is no dearth of stuff that you can say is demonstrably happening. Wars gone to under false pretenses. Heroes that exposed the uh, irresponsibility, cruelty and dishonesty of the American government cast out to live lives in exile. Not one, but two presidents not pardoning them. One of them Donald Trump, one of them Barack Obama. So whichever one of them you happen to think is a great hero, neither of them sought to pardon Edward Snowden, a man who, in my opinion, plainly exhibits the uh, potentialities and attributes of a hero, i.e. willing to sacrifice himself for a better idea. And what is that idea? Ordinary people deserve to have agency over their own lives. Ordinary people deserve to be free. And if we're living in the shadow of the interests of unaccountable people, whether they're governmental or corporate or wealthy for whatever reason, then there is no freedom. Deep down, you're interested in freedom. You want to be able to live the life that you were born to live with the people that you love. Well, think about how is that solution going to be reached? By making powerful people accountable, by presenting alternatives. This, I truly believe, is possible, and that is not a conspiracy. I'll get together and start trying to accomplish exactly what he said, hold people accountable. But, you know, what happens if you start a spear campaign against these politicians and trying to get them out of office and trying to change things too fast? They're going to take a look at your life, you know. And once again, I think this needs to be done. It definitely does. I think there's some people that are, you know, up and coming going to be politicians soon that are young enough and are learning. And they're in positions that could do this kind of stuff. But once again, I'm about personal power, personal responsibility, and personal transformation. And I think... If you want to do that, if you want to have a great life, if you want to have a life where your town is starting to open up, you know, stuff, um, COVID free, um, going to the gyms and stuff like that again, and all the stores are opened up, like we went to Winters today, we went to Home Depot today, we're actually allowed to go inside, the gyms all opened up, everything is starting to slowly open up here, things are starting to get better, and right at this time of year, last year was whenever COVID was hitting full flex, you know, Mardi Gras just happened in New Orleans not that long ago last year at this time, and that's when everything starts spreading, and then all the really harsh lockdowns in the States, it was happening in China in December, whatever the case was, depending on your version of the truth and conspiracy, but this time last year, things were fucking really bad, whereas right now, kids are back in school, things are starting to open up, things are going good here, anyways, for me, I don't know how it is everywhere been actively trying to change my own personal reality make my own personal life better by doing the changes i can and the things that i feel that i have not little to barely any control over i do candles to start gaining control of those time places and then 
as a result of that, I get intuition and ideas, and I'm guided for different areas of my life that I can actually change myself. And by doing that, I slowly keep getting more and more power and more ability to change my external circumstances to the point where this time last year, my wife was nowhere near on board with the stuff that I do, whereas now we can have a whole conversation about it and she's actually listening. So I'm here to say that your best first step is always going to be to change the things you can change within your own reality, your own sphere, your own life at this moment in time. But anyways, so... And I guess the segue out to this, and I'm gonna play a little bit of Pearson. I don't think the clip's very long. I don't know if it's five minutes, 10 minutes, but it's somewhere in between there. And it's just, he was talking about how, I forget how the fucking conversation came about. There's something about how, anyways, you're gonna hear it. But it's basically st stating how, what I just stated from a psychological, psychiatrist point of view from someone who teaches this shit and I don't know if I might chime in one more time I know I'm supposed to get into the different magics to use of the Bible characters as your deities but I gave a few examples earlier and they're gonna be all like that I think my next video I'll go into that into detail and I very much try to remember to do that I, I very much have ADD and I, I get onto an idea and then kind of latch on and I separate from there but because a video I said I wanted to show you how to use the programming you already have, the deities you already have, for example, from your popular religion that probably tells you magic is of the devil. But you can use these deities that are in your mind to manifest stuff. And I was going to give you specific examples on how, and I did give a few already, so I'm not leaving you completely high and dry. But you just have to get your conscious mind okay with the idea that those subconscious deities in your mind are real to your subconscious mind. Therefore, if you do a conscious symbolic representation in present tense, saying that you know you're grateful or thankful that this deity gave you this money or gave you this healing or found you a partner, then you're putting that deity to work, you know? And you know, so if you really want to me to get into, let's say you have Islam or Judaism or Christianity and you want to know how to do this, send me an email if you want, Corey, period, LeBlanc, four ones at gmail.com um, or a comment and tell me exactly specifically what deities and what you want to do and I'll make you your own personal little spell and whatever else for you if you really want me to. And this way it's a little bit easier than me having to give you a bunch of examples right now, which if no one emails me or sends me a comment, which why would they? But if no one does actually take me up on this, which is fine, I'm okay with it either way. Um, just because it's fucking, I think it's 10 o'clock right now. And I gotta work tomorrow morning, so I'm gonna still have to edit this and put it out there and do all that bullshit. So I'm just gonna leave this as is and leave you probably off with Peterson unless I have something else to chime in about. But yeah, if you want me to specifically get into whatever it is you wanna use, let me know. I'll do the research and I'll fucking send you what I think you should do. But yeah, so anyways, here's the psychological um, explanation for what I just said in layman's terms. But now it's gonna be in better terms, coming from Jordan Peterson and himself. First that lasts for 10 years, so better to nip it in the bud. If someone is after you to do something, and you don't feel like you're getting proper regard or proper response, or you don't think it's fair, it's like, have some courage. And get a hold of your anger and use it. Doesn't mean you're right, but at least it means you can push the person hard enough so they have to engage in a dialogue with you. And you know, this is these are necessary skills. Like if you cannot do this, you have to be able to say no to negotiate. You have to be able to say no. So you always want to put yourself in a position where you can do that. That's part of being that's part of power. And the other thing is do not let people push you around. Because you'll get pushed right into a corner and you'll end up as a slave. And that's because there's Tyranny, slavery, or negotiation. That's what you've got. Yes? What if it's not an individual pushing around? If there's no one to engage in a dialogue with, what if it's society as a whole? Then you're looking at it from the wrong perspective. Your, your, your level of analysis is wrong. Because, so, you know, it is society as a whole. But what the hell good is that going to do you? You can't complain to society as a whole. You have to look for the micro manifestations that actually occur in your realm and work on those and that's the only level of analysis you have any 
control over anyways Fix the things that are within your realm of power And what will happen as a consequence of that is that your realm of power will grow But you start local, because like what the hell do you know? You're 19 or 20 or whatever it is Like you have a, you have a scrap with society? It's like that's just an archetypal problem That's all it is Because you don't know enough about society to have that opinion you know, and I'm not being, I'm not being, uh, like, I'm not trying to be cynical about this. I am telling you it's an archetypal problem. You know, of course everybody who's young has a problem with society. You're all at the bottom of the bloody dominance hierarchy. <laughs> Unless you count the entire rest of the world. In which case you're already in the top 1%. Right, so, you know, that's worth thinking about too. So, and, you know, if you, if you are in, involved in a battle in some sense with society, you, you're dominated by the figure of the great father The negative figure of the great father You also have to, a, a lot of what you should do about that is increase your level of gratitude You know, here you are It's warm The chair works, the floor isn't going to fall apart Right, you're at a prestigious institution You're well on your way to being one of the top 1% in society You're just too damn young right now for that to happen You're smart, you're healthy, you're good looking Except for that weird thing you're wearing around your head <laughs> So like, you know, what the hell? It's, everything's good for you So, I'm, I mean, I know there's a tyrannical element There is, it's real But, but if that's all you see you're, you're blinded And that's not good, it'll warp you So, okay, so Here's an example of how people automatically see the world as animated, so it makes sense, so you know, because I said we automatically perceive the world in personified categories, so let's look at this Okay, so I would say that's the beginning of the journey into the unconscious.